I want to welcome everybody on behalf of the National Council for History Education to this wonderful webinar with uh, Peniel Joseph. My name is Laura Wakefield. I'm the program coordinator at NCHE and I'm joined by Matt Messias, who is our education coordinator. He will be helping moderate tonight. And uh, before I introduce Peniel, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that you can ask questions in the Q&A box that's uh, at the bottom of your screen, and most of you, it should be at the bottom. Uh, it just says Q&A, and that's if you have a specific question you'd like to ask Peniel during the webinar, then Matt or I will draw his attention to that as, as we have breaks in the presentation or at, probably at the end. In the meantime, for comments, please uh, write in the chat. Um, it's always good to see what other people are thinking about what's being presented, so we encourage you to do that. And uh, we wanted to also remind you that we have a couple of other webinars coming up in the near future at NCHE. So please take a look at our website under um, professional development and webinars, and you can register for some of those that are coming. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Professor Peniel Joseph. He holds a joint professorship appointment at the LBJ School of Public Affairs and the History Department at the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also the founding director of the LBJ School's Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. And his new book, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. came out today. So we're excited that we're getting to have that be on our watch tonight. So welcome, Peniel, and I'll turn it over to you and I'll go ahead and um, change my video. Can you so. see the slides? Can you see the, the first slide? Yes, the yes, slide. we can. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, I used to teach public school, so I know what it's like. Um, it's, been, it's been a while, um, but I'm, I'm always in awe of um, um, all, all teachers, and I always think of myself still as a um, student, just a lifelong student, very intellectually curious about everything. Um, this is my new book, uh, The Sword and the Shield, The Revolutionary Lives of Martin Luther King Jr. And um, uh, we just got a great review in the New York Times today by Annette Gordon-Reed, who's a, a professor of law and history at Harvard. And um, what this book tries to do is really provide uh, a new framework for understanding Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. And instead of thinking about them as dichotomous, um, you know, nonviolent versus violent, self-defense versus um, uh, peace, um, and sort of black nationalism versus racial integration, um, I make an argument that there are really two revolutionary uh, black political activists, mobilizers, anti-racist activists, organizers, who really fundamentally reshape not only American democracy, but the way in which we think about citizenship and freedom and liberation uh, globally. Um, talk about that more, but when we think about Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X uh, during the heroic period of the civil rights movement in the Black Power era, uh, we speak about them in cliches. And what this book does is really, it's a dual biography examining both men um, initially uh, on their own, and then it braids them together, and really on every page, they're together um, uh, virtually throughout the whole book, and looking at how over time they each influence each other. So I think even our students, and <clears throat> as somebody who's a student and scholar of, of, of American history and African American history, uh, when you encounter Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. through cliches, you're either Team Martin or Team Malcolm. You, you sort of think of yourself as a militant, you know, sort of Black Panther, Black Power person is the team uh, Malcolm and the person who's saying, hey, we want racial integration. We want some politics of empathy and reconciliation uh, considers themselves team Martin. Sometimes people who are very much into and have a religious faith consider themselves team Martin, even though Malcolm um, is, a, is a religious um, uh, public intellectual and a religious uh, figure as well and a faith leader, um, but it's just of the Islamic faith. And, and I argue and really go against, um, against that, that grain. Um, very briefly, I just wanna discuss um, what do we mean by the black power movement? And I'll talk about civil rights as well. I have over here, uh, beginning in the 1950s with political activism of Malcolm X. Really, when we think about black power, black power was a 
and, and really is, because these social movements don't end, whether you think about civil rights, black power, um, uh, feminism, um, women's rights, Latinx struggles, these, these, these continue, but what we study are the high points, the crescendos. So when you think about black power in the modern sense, um, 20th century, uh, we're really talking about Marcus Garvey, Universal Negro Improvement Association, Pan-Africanism, Back to Africa movements um, that were really about radical black political self-determination, but had many different ideological poles, um, including poles that were liberal, conservative, pragmatic, some that were radical, anti-capitalist, some that were obviously nationalist and pan-Africanist. And, and black power is really coming out of that Garvey movement um, in a very discreet way. It also comes out of the Nation of Islam and, and certain black nationalist formations and pan-Africanist formations that were, had achieved their heyday during the Harlem Renaissance, during the Great Migration, and then really um, uh, are, are, are um, transformed during the Great Depression and the Freedom Era. So when we think about the Black Power Movement, it's really not coming just from Stokely Carmichael in 1966 in Greenwood, Mississippi. It's a movement that's talking about radical self-determination, uh, the cultural politics of race, meaning this argument that um, race, racial slavery um, could be utilized uh, in an anti-racist way, but also for radical Black political self-determination. Um, and also, it's, it's a structural critique of Western civilization and racial uh, liberalism um, and the inequality of, of those frameworks and, and paradigms. So let me, let me ask you just, um, if, is it possible for you to go ahead and click under slideshow and, and because we're seeing all the slides on the left as well. Is that okay, possible? Um, click under slideshow. Uh, where is that? Up at the top um, where it says slideshow, uh, if you go underneath that, it, it should say start slideshow. Okay. okay. Yeah, play okay. from start. There you go. Okay. okay. Perfect. So um, this larger struggle to confront radical, um, to confront challenge and transform radical democracy, uh, uncompromising quest for social, political, cultural, and economic transformation and dignity. Uh, the activities of Black power encompassed every facet of African-American political life, yet the story of Black power is largely still unchronicled. Un un when we think about, um, and I don't know if people can see that side of the, um, the, the full slide here. Yes, we see the full slide. We're, we're, it's perfect. Okay, um, so I'm, I just minimized myself a little bit on my screen. Can you still see me? Yes, we still see you. Okay, great. So when we think about um, civil rights, just for, for uh, a short definition, the, the civil rights movement has always um, been uh, a part and a fabric of uh, American society. And, and when we think about um, the modern civil rights movement, you know, we've had historians like Jacqueline Dodd Hall and Nikhil Singh talk about a long civil rights movement, long civil rights era. So you can take civil rights back to antebellum slavery, um, the work of Frederick Douglass, the work of William Lloyd Garrison, um, Ida B. Wells, Mariah Stewart, Sojourner Truth. Uh, when we think about civil rights in the 20th century, we had multiple civil rights movements, including during the Great Depression and World War II. We think about people like Paul Robeson. Um, we think about people like uh, Lorraine Hansberry, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, so many different activists. Um, what we think of as educators about the civil rights movement, we sort of think about the civil rights movement from the Brown decision, uh, May 17th, 1954, all the way to either the Voting Rights Act, uh, August 6, 1965, or Dr. King's assassination, which was Thursday, April 4th, 1968. And, and the reason I call it in this book, um, the heroic period of the civil rights movement, it, we have a narrative that unfolds with cinematic intensity of the Brown decision, um, Emmett Till's um, lynching in, in Montgomery, in, in, um, in, in Money, Mississippi, rather, uh, on August 28, 1955, the, the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, which starts December 1st, 1955, and it's 381 days and really introduces Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., even though it's gonna be Rosa Parks, you know, Jean Theo Harris is the great book, The Rebellious Life of Rosa Parks. And um, um, 
you know, there's, there's so many uh, uh, different works that look at the black women who, who, were, who were key to that, that organizing successful boycott in Montgomery, uh, Alabama. Uh, 1957 is gonna be the Little Rock, Arkansas crisis where Eisenhower is gonna be forced to send in federal troops to desegregate Little Rock Central High School. Uh, February 1st, 1960 is the start of the sit-in movement, Greensboro, North Carolina, which is now a uh, former Woolworths lunch counter is now a civil rights museum in Greensboro. And those are the four black students from a and uh, North Carolina a and which is a HBCU, historically black college university. And then 1961 are the Freedom Rides, which from May to December, there's gonna be about 50 separate Freedom Rides. And the, the, the best book on that is Raymond Arsenault's um, Freedom Rides. And um, that really introduces the public to um, John Lewis, who's now a congressman, uh, who's battling cancer, um, but really one of the heroic figures of this period, who's beaten on the Greyhounds Trailway bus in Anniston, Alabama, by a white mob that the FBI knew was there. And the FBI is very much um, culpable in surveilling, harassing, allowing black and whites to be killed and murdered during this period, which is a part of this narrative people don't want to um, accept. And, and in 1988, there was even a movie that presages the, um, the politics of the current president with just lies um, called Mississippi Burning that actually set up the FBI with Gene Hackman and, and Willem Dafoe as the heroes of, of Mississippi Freedom Summer with no black protagonist. So that's how sort of twisted things um, had, had, had become. Um, 1962, James Meredith becomes the first black student at Ole Miss, and there's three days of rioting in, in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, 1963 is the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation, but it's the spring of Birmingham, Alabama. I have several chapters on Birmingham, and Birmingham and 63 are pivotal turning points and crossroads for both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And 63, of course, is the, the Birmingham, um, the publication of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, um, uh, John F. Kennedy's June 11th um, civil rights speech, uh, Medgar Evers uh, is assassinated on June 12th in the early hours of the morning at his home by a white supremacist, and, and that person's not going to uh, go to jail for 30 more years, and there's the movie um, Ghost of Mississippi, which looks at that. Um, and 63, of course, is also the March on Washington, August 28th, 63. I think one of, one of the things I argue in the book is that the March on Washington is a very revolutionary combative speech, but we remember the I Have a Dream portion where King starts that um, speech with uh, the words, now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and says that we've come here to cash a check that has been stamped insufficient funds, uh, but we refuse to believe that the the Bank of American Justice is, is, is bankrupt. So it's a very, very combative speech, but, but we don't, and we can talk about that. We don't remember it that way. And of course, uh, September 15th, the, the, the um, four little girls in, uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama at the 16th Street Baptist Church, which is the same church that Condoleezza Rice's family actually went to in Birmingham, you know, upper middle class church are bombed by, by white terrorists. And, and certainly on November 22nd, 63, Kennedy's assassinated. And in 64, we usually think about Freedom Summer and the, the, the three civil rights workers, Shorney, Cheney, and Goodman. And if you're from New York, you know there's the Andrew Goodman Foundation that continues social justice work who are murdered by a combination of Philadelphia police uh, uh, and law enforcement and white supremacists. Um, July 2nd is the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and, and Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman are gonna become national martyrs of the movement in Mississippi, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And uh, 65, we have Selma. We just uh, celebrated the 55th anniversary of um, Selma. And this is where at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, about 500 demonstrators, including again, uh, Congressman John Lewis, who was then chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, are gonna be brutalized by Alabama state troopers for trying to wage this peaceful march um, across Mississippi, excuse me, across um, Alabama from, from Selma to Montgomery. And um, that violence is gonna really transform the movement in, in vital ways. Lyndon Johnson, who's president, is gonna make a joint address to Congress 
where he talks about the dignity of man, the destiny of democracy, ends that speech, what we shall overcome. But he, he makes the argument that the, 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 the folks who, are, um, uh, who had been assaulted on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and there's the movie by Ava DuVernay, Selma, a, a, a terrific movie, um, are really heroes, you know, and he compares them to the revolutionaries, American revolutionaries who fought in Concord and Lexington, Massachusetts. And then of course, August 6, 1965, the Voting Rights is passed and, and Act is passed. And that's what we think of as the heroic period of the civil rights movement. Um, that, that narrative um, is both important, but it's also one that obscures and evades um, the, the violence of the era, the combativeness of the era, um, the, the notion that somehow civil rights was always thought of as a moral and political and social good is just untrue. Um, and, and I think that one of the things that this book tries to do is really recapture that period and see just how dangerous and deadly a time it was and to really look at the way in which both King and Malcolm at times were pragmatist, at times um, radical and revolutionary, at times reactionary in terms of the terrain that they were facing. Um, any, any questions here before I, I move on? And Laura, you can let me know if they're... Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple of questions um, they wanted to, to know about the um, books that you mentioned, and I think we could provide a list Oh yeah, participants I give you, yeah, of that. I give you a list um, of books, absolutely. But um, yeah, I had I had a question for you. Um, I was thinking about what you were saying about the different civil rights figures, and and um, you you named so many going all the way back um, to Sojourner Truth and and Frederick Douglass. And I just wondered if um, you know, as a high school teacher, if you were teaching high school and knowing they don't have you know a lot of time to to teach the civil rights yeah, movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there someone you'd really think that you could focus on or, or who, who would you, who really stands out as someone well, that, that maybe is overlooked and maybe should be talked about? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, I would say I would focus on Malcolm and Martin as, as um, conduits both to the past and present. Certainly some people who've been left out are people like um, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is really the forerunner uh, in so many ways of Dr. King and this idea of um, racial integration, but also Malcolm X and this idea of self-determination. He even has a speech um, when you read the new biography, the Pulitzer Prize winning biography by David Blight, um, um, uh, you know, prophet of, of freedom, Frederick Douglass, uh, a ballad or the bullet speech in the 1860s. So I would say Frederick Douglass is somebody who you could really look at and teach in the 19th century. And also Douglas is a feminist. You know, Douglas is one of the most ardent fe feminists of the 19th century, even though they were calling it um, suffragist in, in that context, but all they're saying is feminist. So um, he's, he's uh, very important. And then in terms of an unsung African-American woman um, who, who you can really connect both to Malcolm and Martin and to the present in terms of Black Lives Matter, um, trying to do criminal justice reform, ending mass incarceration, would be um, would be Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells, the book Red Record and all the the, the anti-lynching crusade. She's a mentee of Frederick Douglass and then becomes really one of the foremost activists in her own right. Um, should have been um, friends with somebody like W.E.B. Du Bois, but Du Bois's own uh, sexism, uh, deep sexism and misogyny prevent that. So she's somebody who's um, there's big biographies of Ida B. Wells now, but I would say those two, Ida B. Wells and, and, and Frederick Douglass. Um, getting back to right here, um, and I'll get another question. I have on this slide, post-war American liberalism, racial identity and American citizenship, democratic institutions, rights, legal, political, social, economic, cultural. Malcolm and Martin let us get to all these things. And this idea of post-war American liberalism and this idea of American exceptionalism, guns and butter um, coming out of the post-war prosperity of the Second World War, the destruction of, of, of parts of Europe and the um, competitive advantage relative of American capitalism and the rapprochement between labor and, 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 and labor and big business, 
uh, really produce um, the, the, the biggest and fastest economic growth in American history for the most Americans in American history. Uh, so that, that, you know, Thomas Piketty talks about this as well. So what, what's interesting is that that also sets up a stage for um, more robust Black activism. And the Cold War framework really allows Black activists to um, push back against the hypocrisy of not just Jim Crow racial segregation, uh, but the politics and practice of white supremacy that really uh, marginalized Black life chances, you know, in every single um, social economic category and just day-to-day -day living. Uh, and in many ways that, that continues, even though you have a strata of, of Black Americans who, who, who have um, much more access than they did uh, in the, in the post-war period. And so when you think about racial identity and American citizenship, one of the things that I argue is that Malcolm X um, pushes for radical Black dignity and King pushes for radical Black citizenship. And what I mean by that is that Malcolm makes an argument and King eventually is actually going to follow aspects of that argument. And, and King's going to make an argument that Malcolm eventually is going to follow aspects of as well. So when you think about the metaphor of the sword and the shield, um, in the cliche, Malcolm's the sword and King's the shield, when you dig down deep uh, historically, they, they both are the sword and they both are the shield in different points of their career simultaneously. And so Malcolm's notion of radical Black dignity is really centered on American history. And by that, I mean, he makes an argument that racial slavery um, comprises um, the central narrative in America that whites and Blacks don't want to face. So he really links racial slavery to contemporary exploitation of Black people, including himself, who had served seven years in prison. And so he links that exploitation to um, the politics of white supremacy, racial slavery, um, Jim Crow segregation, and makes an argument that Black folks need dignity and they need to have not only dignity in the United States, but in Africa and the third world so that they can leverage that power to have actual self-determination and citizenship. So for Malcolm, radical dignity is um, not just the end of racial oppression, but it's a positive and assertive African-American identity that he criticizes white people don't have, but he also criticizes black people as lacking uh, because of sort of the brainwashing of racial segregation and being in a society that rejects your humanity. And that really lies about its own history. So Malcolm loved um, uncovering and dispelling um, American lies. Uh, King, on the other hand, really believes in this idea of radical citizenship. And what I mean by that is that King, through the course of 13 years uh, in the public spotlight, roughly 13 years, 12 and a half, if we're going to be very, very specific, um, what King does is this. He argues that citizenship goes beyond voting rights acts, um, civil rights acts. It goes beyond the ending of systems of racial oppression. And what citizenship actually requires is health care. It requires a guaranteed living wage. It, in, it requires an environment free of anti-racism. It requires food and nourishment. It's very, very interesting. So when you think about the Poor People's Campaign, King makes education a right, health care a right. Um, and even in the 63 speech on the March on Washington, uh, he says that he knows what he's talking about is seemingly impossible. And on that search to justice, people are going to have to struggle together. And what King says in that speech is he says, we're going to have to go to jail together. And he says, we're going to have to go to jail together because King realizes that he's living in an unjust society. So in an unjust society, and we know Bertolt Brecht and the whole idea of like, you know, where is the honest man in an evil society in prison, the person's in prison, because that's where you're going to be in a society where there's no justice. And so King very forthrightly understands that. So King is part of this uh, uh, Black Christian, Black social gospel prophetic tradition, um, alongside of being interested in Gandhi and nonviolence. And the, the, when you think about Congress of Racial uh, Equality, CORE, Fellowship of Reconciliation, this sort of interracial pacifism 
that's coming out of the 1930s and coming out of the 1940s. So he's doing that alongside of the Black social gospel. And when we think about the social gospel, the Black social gospel is really a very uh, 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 radical uh, tradition of saying that we're going to look at the Bible, um, Old and New Testament, and we're going to think about how we can change things right here on earth um, and, and look upon Jesus as this radical um, um, pro prophetic figure um, in ways that really pushes you to become more political than, say, the, the parallel mega churches of the time. And I'm thinking about Billy Graham and the Crusades. Like Billy Graham's Crusades said nothing about racial segregation. So Billy Graham was this white supremacist Christian where Dr. King and Malcolm, even though Malcolm admired Billy Graham's ability to mobilize, they wanted to mobilize um, and politicize people to transform po power relations. So they're both talking about redistributive justice. Um, democratic institutions, they're both intensely interested in democratic institutions. Over time, Malcolm's interest is going to grow as King starts to influence him. Malcolm's interest in Democrat, and he, you know, even when Malcolm gets interested in it, he's interested in the way in which Black people might take control of these Democratic institutions and has less faith in them than King does. King is going to be eventually start losing his faith in the aftermath of the Watts Rebellion in 1965, which I talk about as well. And finally, this, this slide, and I'll move to the next, rights, legal, political, social, economic, cultural. You know, both King and Malcolm um, really uh, innovate new rights and a new conception of rights, meaning that folks are just born uh, with the right to access um, human rights. You know, they both become these human rights champions that say that that's beyond nation state and really caste or class or race, um, there are human rights that everyone is just fundamentally born with, but that the society has not recognized and that we have to organize for, right? That are already legitimate, but we have to push governments and institutions and people um, and other citizens to respect the, the, the fundamental human rights of, of all. Um, this is March 26, 1964 at the U.S. Senate, and um, this is Dr. King and Malcolm's only uh, physical meeting, even though there's going to be another speech where Malcolm is in the audience after King's uh, Nobel Prize later that year. And um, when I think about King and Malcolm X, one of the arguments I make is that they're not only social movement leaders, they're really policy advocates and political lobbyists. I think we kind of think of King that way. We don't think of Malcolm that way. And um, Malcolm is part of uh, the 128th uh, Precinct Welcoming Committee in Harlem. Um, he's part of uh, efforts to sort of reform the criminal justice system and its treatment of Black Muslims and um, or, or African Americans who happen to be Muslim and um, just people in general. Uh, he's part of... Um, efforts to bring African leaders and diplomats to Harlem. He has an office at the United Nations and even before 1964 is very, very well known um, to folks who are connected to embassies, both ambassadors and their people uh, who, are, who are representing um, independent nations in Africa and the Middle East and the Third World. So they're, pol they're political lobbyists too. Obviously, Dr. King, voting rights, desegregation, uh, they, have fun they have fundamental critiques of American democracy. Um, one of the things that I do throughout The Sword and the Shield is examine the way in which both Malcolm and Martin interfaced with American presidents. You know, they, they got critiques of uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, who were the presidents during their lives. Uh, Dr. King gets a chance to meet all those three and have um, a fairly tight working relationship with Lyndon Johnson, um, disappointed in Kennedy, but he admires Kennedy, and Kennedy comes around in that the last year of Kennedy's life. Uh, Malcolm is definitely frustrated with uh, the tenor of um, presidential support for the civil rights movement, and is a vociferous critic of Eisenhower, um, Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Malcolm is an early critic of the Vietnam War, comes out against the Vietnam War in 1964 and 65, 
Uh, King comes out later, mo most forcefully starting in 1967, sort of following Malcolm's lead. This idea of defining and challenging state sanctioned violence is important too, because Malcolm, one of his most infamous statements is in the aftermath of Kennedy's assassination, saying that the assassination um, showed him was an example of chickens coming home to roost. And he was a farm boy, an old farm boy, and chickens coming home to roost didn't make him sad, it made him glad. And people said that he was rejoicing over the Kennedy assassination. That's not what Malcolm was saying. Malcolm was saying that Kennedy was a victim of the violence that the United States had ignited around the world, paradoxically in the name of justice and human rights. So Malcolm is saying before King in 67 says, America is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. Malcolm says that Kennedy's assassination is chickens coming home to roost. So the same violence that the America had sanctioned around the world in the name of democracy, in the name of anti-communism, in the name of human rights had ricocheted and come back to haunt um, the American nation state. So this idea of challenging state sanctioned violence, wherever it may occur, including police brutality against African-Americans, and then finally, outlining the, outlining the global contours of racial justice and human rights. One of the things I do throughout The Sword and the Shield is really travel with Malcolm and Martin internationally, with Dr. King in Ghana and India and Europe, and with Malcolm in the Middle East in 1959 uh, for five weeks, and then really for almost a year, for, for, for about 30 weeks on two separate trips uh, in 1964, where he goes to multiple African countries including Nigeria, uh, Ghana, um, Liberia, uh, uh, Tanzania. Um, and he also goes to London, he goes to Paris. He just goes all around trying to build these alliances um, to really call out the United States and its racial segregation, its violence against black bodies and its hypocrisy and have newly emerging African nation states support um, what he's calling a human rights campaign by 1964. All right, uh, I'll stop there. Okay, we do have a number of questions and we have a lot of comments. People were, are really struck by uh, what, you, what you've been talking about and, and are excited about what they're learning because they feel like this is, there's a lot that they have, um, that they need to share with their students. Um, well, that's great. So, so let's see. Um, one of the questions was uh, what Mark wanted to know, what difference in overall impact did John Lewis's toned down Wake Up America speech have on the movement? Yeah, I think Lewis was the last living speaker, uh, one of the main speakers of the March on Washington. That's a very powerful speech. Um, and you're right, Mark, that it was toned down initially. And it's a speech collectively written. So it wasn't a speech that John Lewis had written himself. It's really all of um, SNCC, and those are people like Jim Foreman, who's executive director of SNCC, who's very, very radical. Um, um, and it was a speech that talked about, you know, uh, burning down the racism in the South, and and that they were going to build a nonviolent army, and just like General Sherman burned Atlanta, they were going to they were going to blaze a torch of freedom throughout the South. Um, no, even the toned down speech is a very, very militant speech. And I think John Lewis in the 1960s is actually militant. He meets Malcolm X in Africa. They meet in Kenya. It's just that John Lewis seems not as militant if we contrast him with Stokely Carmichael, we contrast him with Malcolm X, if we contrast him with some of the most uh, revolutionary figures of the time, but certainly the young John Lewis is militant. He's just nonviolent Christian uh, pacifist but he's militant in terms of wanting freedom. So I think that that March on Washington speech is, is, is very, very powerful. Um, interesting comment from Cynthia. She said, uh, what strikes me as eye-opening is that my personal experience was just learning about Martin Luther King, but not really Malcolm X. I've never considered this much. Now I wonder if it was based on what, I was, what was meant to be taught or if it was a result of what my teachers agreed with more. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I would say that it's basically what people agreed with more. It was very hard to scrub up Malcolm X. We have a new documentary series, and I'm actually one of the, the, the talking heads there on Netflix, uh, who killed Malcolm X, which is really important in six parts that you could use. 
in addition to things like Eyes on the Prize. But it gets, it gets when, you, when you read Malcolm and you listen to Malcolm and you find out his story, you see that he's not um, this purveyor of violence and hatred that the cliches insisted on starting in the 1950s and, and continue to this day. I think that uh, Malcolm has been rehabilitated somewhat, but um, there was always this effort to contrast Malcolm and Martin. Um, and in some ways, Malcolm was fine with that because he knew that King could leverage how people perceived him to get more gains. But when you look at their careers, by 1963-64, Malcolm is much closer to King, even as he's not talking about nonviolence. He's much closer in terms of his appreciation for democratic institutions and his appreciation for King's ability and prowess as a mobilizer to mobilize uh, you know, tens of thousands, at times hundreds of thousands, uh, into um, action um, and into arrest and self-sacrifice uh, in, in an effort to transform um, American democracy. So I do think that there was and still is a bias against King. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote this book was really to provide people, students, but educators like everyone here, really a reference point where, you know, you yourself can understand them, get a better handle. I understand how hard it is to have to read a ton of books. Um, in, in, this is, an, this is a, a, a way to do it in just, in just one book, even though there are hundreds um, of books about Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. and, and, and you know, thousands of articles about them. But looking at them side by side, not only is it a great teaching tool, but just for yourself, you'll, you'll be able to understand them better at flaws and all. I mean, this is not hagiography. Hey, I criticize both of them uh, for, for mistakes, um, shortcomings. Um, um, they, they are human, uh, but, but they're exceedingly important um, and ambitious and talented as well. And they, they, um, they have something to teach us all and have really left a legacy that's, that's hugely important um, uh, you know, especially pedagogically as well as politically. Yes, and on the same vein, um, we have some teachers who teach um, elementary, and yes. they're they're saying that they love. Uh, Tiffany mentions that she loves the idea of exploring more than Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks in terms of learning about the civil rights movement for African Americans. But as a primary teacher, she feels like we get stuck there a lot. Any <laughs> suggestions for integrating a wider view in, in elementary grade? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, one way you can do it is looking at the year 1963. You know, I'm actually working on a new book now just on that year in the civil rights movement. And when you look at that year, you get a, a cast of characters that are very, very important. Malcolm and Martin, and I think one way you can integrate um, more people in is through Malcolm X. Um, Malcolm is really the leader uh, when we trace the genealogy of the Black Power movement to this movement for Black Power, that is right there in 63, but it doesn't have a name. And some of those people include people like um, uh, Gloria Richardson, uh, who's an African-American activist, civil rights activist from Cambridge, Maryland, uh, who's leading an anti-racist struggle there. Bobby Kennedy meets with Gloria Richardson and, and they negotiate a peace treaty in the summer of 63. Uh, Lorraine Hansberry is one of the, 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 the Black artist who uh, you know obviously wrote Raisin in the Sun and meets with Bobby Kennedy on May 24th uh, 1963 alongside of James Baldwin and Harry Belafonte um, at, at Bobby Kennedy's um, uh, his house his, his father Joseph Kennedy's apartment in New York to sort of get uh, a conversation going about civil rights and racial justice um, you know Medgar Evers uh, before his assassination is someone to talk about friend of James Baldwin, NAACP field secretary, 37 years old, World War II veteran. Um, these are all people who are fighting for racial justice. And of course, James Baldwin, um, you know, openly gay, uh, you know, literary genius. He has friends and admirers of both Malcolm, Martin, and Medgar. Um, so there's a way to open it up and to see, you know, and, and another person would be, you know, Ella, Ella Jo Baker, who's the organizer of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and all the work she's doing in, in, in Mississippi and other places um, um, during this time period. So um, there's definitely a way to, to open it up. And always think, in, in terms of your, your students, always remember how young people were during this time period. I mean, the students who are sitting in 
are in their teens, but the students who in 1963 in Birmingham, about 1,100 are arrested uh, in the so-called Children's Crusade starting May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, um, organized by James Bevel, one of King's lieutenants, um, are gonna be you know, in the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth grade who are filling up jails in Birmingham. So it's, it's important for them to realize just how, um, you know, the depth and breadth of this and how young people were who, who did participate. You ready for some more questions or did you oh, want to? Okay. Um, do one more and then I'll do, I, I got to see how many slides I have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, uh, Theodore said, what interaction, re inter he was curious about what you said about Martin Luther King and Billy Graham. Um, wondering what what relationship they had, and and how did you how is it that you say that Billy Graham was a white supremacist? Yeah, I don't. I, you know, th there's not much of a relationship there. I mean, I think Bill, Billy Graham is. You know, he's a Christian who's seeing things through a, a a Cold War framework, and racial integration is communist. And the reason why I'm saying he's a white supremacist is that Billy Graham was not um, this open anti-racist against racial segregation in the context of 1950s and 1960s and 70s. And he should have been, you know, because he was saying he was a man of God, you know? So what you saw, and Dr. King used to say, the most segregated hour uh, in America was church with white churches and black churches and never shall the twain meet. So you have a bunch of Christians then and now who they are serving a white God. Uh, fortunately for some of us, our God is not white, right? And so we are included in the kingdom of heaven, but in the context of, uh, you know, Billy Graham and those crusades, of course, yeah, of course he's a racial uh, segregationist. I mean, it's sad. I wish there was a narrative where Billy Graham was this awesome anti-racist hero and advocate. I think he would have had a lot less people come to those revivals if he said, hey, part of what you need to do to save your soul is to be for racial integration and to be your sister and brother's keeper, irrespective of race. Um, you're not gonna get standing ovations doing that. Okay, let's see, we have one more. Um, one of the, uh, Shauna said, I taught on this topic today. I wish my students could be here, but could you talk a bit about the influence of the African-American civil rights movement upon other movements like the AIM, Red and Yellow Power, the gay rights movement, et cetera? No, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the things I make an argument about in this book too is that King is seeing these struggles through the particular lens of race and black people, um, but he's, he's, he's looking for the universal um, from that particular. So when you think about the black freedom struggle historically, it's at the cutting edge of transforming really um, all social justice movements, whether we're talking about women's rights um, or anybody else. In a very specific way, uh, during the post-war um, civil rights movement, you do find um, um, SNCC and different activists impacting and helping um, farm workers. When we're thinking about Cesar Chavez, um, we, you, as the movements get further radicalized, we think about groups like the Brown Berets, we think about there's a new book on the Young Lords uh, by Joanna Fernandez. Um, there were, um, you know, poor whites, people like preacher men um, who, who uh, were trying to organize, including the Southern Student Organizing Society um, com um, Committee, rather, SSOC, which tried to be like sort of a white version of SNCC. Certainly there's Students for a Democratic Society, which is Tom Hayden, who's a, the late Tom Hayden, who's a friend. Um, talked about how moved they were by SNCC and meeting people like Stokely Carmichael and Ella Baker and John Lewis. And so um, Asian American movements, Mexican American movements, Puerto Rican, Dominican, um, the American Indian movement, including, you know, when you think about, um, yeah, Russell Means and, and uh, this idea of, of uh, people like Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture actually um, organized alongside of them, takeovers of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So these were, and, and certainly Fred Hampton, who's the Chicago Black Panther, and he coins the term rainbow radicalism in a very pointed way in Chicago in 1968, 69, tries to bring um, African-American and Latinx and Asian-American 
um, indigenous peoples together. And certainly, of course, um, Martin Luther King Jr., the Poor People's March, meets with um, Black, uh, Latinx, uh, Native American people, and poor whites to try to build this coalition, um, this rainbow coalition. So the Black freedom struggle has always been at the cutting edge, not because Black people are so special, but because um, they have been the most uh, marginalized actively and, and um, continuously. And uh, really, when you think about um, social economic indicators and life chances that, that persist uh, to this day, and they've influenced and inspired other um, groups of people of color and indigenous movements. I'm going to very quickly just finish this, this, this slide. Um, when you think about what happened after King responds to a, a transforming political landscape and makes plans to secure voting rights, um, after 63, Malcolm X takes a pilgrimage to, to Mecca, the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, when you think about very, just a, a wrap up, when you think about Malcolm X, um, and I have him here as the sword, unapologetic insistency on radical black dignity, black nationalism transformed into declaration for political independence. And when you think about black nationalism, we're talking about unity, the cultural politi politics of race and, and and um, political self-determination. And by cultural politics of race, I mean more than just black is beautiful, but this, this, this notion that um, black history and culture, um, if we center them, uh, can transform the world, right? So this notion of not thinking of them as an additive, but thinking of them, and I'm, and I'm also talking about African history too here. Thinking, thinking of it as something that can um, be paradigmatic and transform how we think of, uh, of the world. Um, unapologetic Black love and collective redemption. Um, it's very important to say that Malcolm, along with King, but Malcolm I'll speak of right now, um, political integrity, personal sincerity, and love um, for Black people, which is very, very important. Malcolm loved Black people that other Black people didn't like, including people who have been incarcerated, people like himself, uh, Malcolm um, loses his father at an early age to um, a, a racial, really what he describes as a racial lynching in 1931. Um, and he, his mother is institutionalized. Uh, he's one of seven kids. And, um, you know, re really, you know, it's, he's, he experiences a lot and he, he comes to understand the depth of, of black pain and suffering and trauma and does a lot to try to transform that. I have him here as Black America's prosecuting attorney. And by that, I mean, Malcolm prosecutes um, America as a nation state for a series of crimes that they've committed against black communities in the past and the present. Uh, Dr. King, uh, you know, the shield personified struggle for racial justice. Nonviolence is the shield against humiliation, poverty and, and uh, violence of America's Jim Crow system. Um, he's the chief defense attorney when you think about black uh, folks and white folks. He defends black people to white people, talks about black humanity. Um, he defends white people to black people and says that whites can be transformed uh, through the sacrifice of, of nonviolent civil disobedience. So he's, 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 and you know, King believes in democracy more than the architects of American democracy in terms of the founding fathers. And, and becomes one of the new founding fathers and architects of democracy. Conciliatory image mass beating heart of a political radical. Um, when you think about their differences, um, their differences were complementary. Uh, the key differences, role of violence, source of oppression, um, the nation of Islam and the African-American church, um, opposing visions of racial equality at the start, um, Yet these current views underestimate how over time each persuaded the other to become more like himself. Um, when we think about Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, this idea of the 1619 project that the New York Times have done in, in sort of 400 years uh, of, of, of American democracy, it's important for us to understand that they're some of the architects of reimagining and thinking um, in, in our, our thinking about citizenship, freedom, a democracy, a racial slavery. One of the things I talk about in the book is how striking it is how both of them talk about slavery and its impact 
um, consistently in speeches. Uh, from Birmingham to Bandung, their notion of freedom was very much global. It included Africa, it included the third world, it included um, non-whites as well as whites. Um, they reimagined black citizenship and dignity uh, in terms of the global, uh, the global North and South. And then the final, um, and I'll take uh, whatever questions we have, uh, this is from the book, um, Malcolm, Malcolm and Martin traveled down a shared revolutionary path in search of black dignity, citizenship, and human rights that would trigger national and global political reckonings around issues of race and democracy that still reverberate today. And certainly um, that is true, we can, we can <laughs> dis discuss that. Um, so I know we're running out of time, we have like five minutes, yeah. <laughs> well, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat about um, the relationship between, uh, you know, about the FBI and, and their concern about both yeah. um, Malcolm and Martin, but also about how, um, why, uh, why there was a, um, a suspicion of communism and so forth related to the Black Panther movement and, and the things that they were doing. And so there, there's been a lot of interesting things people are, are talking about. Um, so, um, one of the questions is, how do you prepare your lesson in a way where the students, whoops, I'm losing it. Um, I lost that question. Oh, where the students you have in class, sorry, I'm, I can, it's, it, it helps if it's in the chat box. Maybe, it, maybe it's in the Q&A later and I just haven't seen it. Okay, so Kelly wanted to know, in your opinion, do you think that Malcolm X is not viewed as a religious man or man of faith like King because of America's Christian-centric tendencies? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that we, and we know it now in the age of terror that we are um, unbelievably Islamophobic and it's not just the president of the United States. So that is one of the big reasons then and now. And really he becomes an Orthodox Muslim, uh, but even when he's part of the Nation of Islam, we should um, respect him because he's a man of faith. Um, so yes, that is absolutely uh, why. Yeah, and she, she adds that um, those religious differences um, contribute to him being seen as more radical because of the yeah. bias against absolutely. the religion. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then Chris wanted to know, what was your biggest um, revelation while researching your, for your book? Yeah, I mean, one of them was um, that, that Malcolm X um, is in the audience sitting next to Andy Young when Dr. King gives a speech in New York City, December 16th, um, 1964. After winning the Nobel Prize, he comes back to New York and really around the country and he's feted. Vice President Hubert Humphrey is there, all these people um, there in the morning, gets the key to the city. And in the evening, he does a speech before over 8,000 people at the 369th Armory in Harlem and Malcolm is in the audience. He's in the audience. Nelson Rockefeller's there, all these people, and Malcolm X is, is there listening to the entire speech right next to Andy Young a few months before his death. And he later talks about the speech uh, in, in, in Harlem and says how much there were aspects of the speech that he supported and, and, and appreciated. So uh, that was surprising. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that. So that was, um, that was neat to find out and sort of try to investigate and explore and, 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 uh, and write about. Just as a follow-up to that, was there, um, where, did you, where did you delve most? Was there one particular uh, library or archive that you used more than any other that that um, you know, I use, you know, there, there's a bunch. I mean, the King archives, I've, I've um, explored. Malcolm X has archives at the Schomburg. Um, I've gone to archives in Washington, D.C. Um, so, so many different archives. So there was, you know, certainly the Malcolm X papers at the Schomburg for Malcolm. And, and really, some of King's, the, the, the primary source published volumes, the seven volumes, um, in addition to what's at the archives were very important because they have so many of the speeches that Claiborne Carson has edited um, out of Stanford. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Amanda, this is the question I was trying to read earlier. When dealing with students in a class who are racist, what are ways that you prepare your lesson in order to cut off those student comments in advance and keep their minds open? 
Well, it's tough. I mean, I think you have to have um, empathy. I mean, I think that, you know, part of it is rule setting in terms of respect, right? Um, but even if people say something that's wrong, especially if you're teaching at the high school level or younger, you have to have empathy for them. There's a um, great anthology called Seeing Race Again by Kimberly Crenshaw, which is an edited anthology that I just taught faculty who wanted to diversify their curriculum. There's 21 chapters in there, and there's one chapter that's precisely on that that you should check out. The, the book is called Seeing Race Again, um, and it's combating colorblindness in the disciplines, but it really would um, uh, be connected to, to this. All right, there's time for one more question, and that, <laughs> that's it, because I have... Uh, okay. Um, finally, the last one, so much is talked about in regards to the impact of Martin Luther King's nonviolent approach on the civil rights movement and legis legislation. What would you say were Malcolm X's greatest accomplishments? Yeah, I think that Malcolm's greatest accomplishment is pushing for radical political self-determination and making black people see themselves um, more clearly and to love themselves more clearly. And I think that he organized um, uh, a coalition of African Americans at times with some radical whites, especially by 64, 65, to be vociferous critics of white supremacy, of what scholars are calling racial capitalism, but they're just meaning the racism within capitalism historically that exploits black bodies even as it extracts profits from them, whether it's mass incarceration or athletics or, or anything and everything, or, or picking cotton or being part of sugar plantation. So I think Malcolm's um, greatest achievement is pushing uh, for this idea of radical black dignity and the way in which that conception of black identity and black citizenship um, and critique of American democracy actually influences and impacts King and certainly the larger um, black power uh, movement. So Malcolm's um, legacy is not necessarily uh, legislation per se. Um, it's going to be um, in a lot of ways um, transforming uh, Black communities to be able to comprehend uh, the violence um, of American democracy, what, 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 it had, um, what it had wrought on their own lives, and to put themselves uh, to be, to, to have enough understanding and comprehension to utilize that knowledge um, and not want revenge, but certainly push for a reckoning. Malcolm wanted a reckoning. Sometimes people mistake that with revenge. But what a reckoning is, is this idea of making people um, who've long been denied be able to boldly sp speak truth to power and to certainly bend society's will in a way um, that will transform um, regimes of oppression and racism and marginalization into... Um, um, institutions that are that are just and 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 pro people and pro human rights. So I think Malcolm uh, is hugely transformative um, in 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 that way, and I think that's why we still continue um, to talk about him. And and you know you know my short answer to that would be this: you know Malcolm talked about Black Lives Mattering um, and believed that Black Lives mattered uh, before the Black Lives Matter movement. That's, that's my short answer. So, um, you know, there, so way before there was legislation, he believed, and remember, it's Malcolm X who called Negroes black people, right? <laughs> and now we call ourselves uh, African American, but black is, is in some ways more expansive um, because it's, um, it's inclusive of people who are from the Caribbean, people from West Africa, just the whole entire Afri African diaspora. So, that's what I would say. Malcolm taught us that Black lives mattered and that, that we should love ourselves um, way before um, even many Black people, including Dr. King. Dr. King was calling us Negroes. He eventually came around, right? But Malcolm is a trail setter and a trailblazer in that because he was saying we were Black. And he also taught us to um, try and get over our trauma of the shame of slavery and, and, and racial segregation and racial violence against Black people, you know? That's because there's a trauma that we all still have, and there's great scholarship on this to, to this day. And he, he did that by saying that, one, Black people weren't to blame, so he went away from this idea of victim blaming. And then two, 
um, really casting a strobe light on American society and American institutions and American citizens um, from top, top to bottom and bottom to top. And he, again, like a prosecutor said, that they were guilty of crimes. And these crimes were crimes of white supremacy, crimes of racial privilege, um, cr crimes of um, immorality and unethical behavior because it was a crime to treat and exploit black people like this and to think that you're gonna get away with it scot-free. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was really, really wonderful. Oh, and the, the audience is really appreciating uh, what you've thank done. You so, so thank much. you so much. And we will be sending out, um, uh, I have a survey for those of you who are still in here. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, here we go. If you could take the survey, that would be wonderful. And we will send that out as well and then email to you tomorrow. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And we look forward to seeing you at future NCHE webinars.